You know who this is. In 1984, Michael Jordan signed a five-year shoe deal with Nike the same day he scheduled to debut in the NBA. Meetings emphasized him getting his own signature shoe, and by the end of the season in April of 1985, Nike would unfail Air Jordan. They would turn out to be pretty popular, and would continue to be, due in part to the success of the Chicago Bulls, who was a franchise winning five championships at that point in time, driven in large part by Michael Jordan, who at that point had been etched in as the greatest NBA player of all time and a global icon for basketball. And with the release of the Air Jordan 12s looming, Nike needs to promote the shoe in some way. In doing so, Nike would create a commercial featuring the superstar that would spawn one of the most iconic quotes from an individual. I've failed over and over and over again in my life. And that is why I succeed. If you've used short form video platforms such as TikTok, Instagram Reels, or YouTube Shorts within the last two years or so, chances are you've heard this audio before. Oh lord. Now, for those unaware of the audio's origins, would you believe me if I told you that person who said it was this guy? I'm sure you've heard the story by now. They came the chosen one while only a junior at high school, compared to Michael Jordan, signed with Nike before his rookie debut. You've heard it before. In 2006, LeBron James had become one of the biggest and most beloved stars in the NBA and was slowly entering best player in the league discussions. At this point, LeBron had gotten his own signature shoe, whereas before he wore the Nike Zoom Generation line of shoes. With the fourth model of this shoe soon to release, Nike decided to go with an interesting ad campaign. Which brings us back to here. This commercial is one in a series of eight different commercials for the LeBron 4 line of shoes, titled The LeBrons and created by the ad agency Whedon & Kennedy, then known as Whedon & Kennedy, whom they had worked with in prior years. This campaign aims to depict four different sides of LeBron, the focused, hardworking athlete side, the older, more critical side, the business side, more interested in his stardom, and the joyful kid side, and the scenarios they find themselves in, all with some Nike branding of course, and is where our oh, Lord. audio comes from. The swimming pool ad has been frequently touted as one of the best commercials starring LeBron, appearing on multiple lists compiling his best ads, and helped to add a bit more character and personality to the rising superstar, and even foreshadowed the season ahead. You can't get through Detroit training in no pool. You, you think Michael training in the pool? Sticking with the Nike brand, but pivoting to a more well-known sport, in 2014, in the run-up to the FIFA World Cup for that year, Nike once again teamed up with Whedon and Kennedy to create the ad campaign known as Risk Everything. Yeah, you know, some good advice that is. While a lot of media was created for this ad campaign, I want to focus specifically on this ad here, referred to as Winner Stays. Now, have you ever envisioned yourself as your favorite athlete while playing a sport? Or maybe you wanted to cater your playstyle to match that athlete? Or even imagine playing alongside that athlete inside a big stadium? Well, this ad plays on that imagination you once had. Starting as a simple seven-a-side game of football in a local park, the boys soon envisioned themselves as various stars such as Ronaldo, Neymar, David Luiz, Pique, Rooney, Iniesta, and Eden Hazard to name a few, playing in a sold-out stadium, alongside some humorous moments sprinkled in. Neymar will never do that. The ad has been viewed an estimated 100 million times and has 64 million views on YouTube alone. And really, who's surprised? The most popular and viewed sport in the world, playing up on the aspects of seeing yourself as one of the all-time greats in a creative way in the lead up to a massive sporting event, of course many people are going to come back and look at it fondly. All three of the ads mentioned have left something that most ads nowadays can barely replicate, and that's a lasting impact. Or legacy, if you will. It more lies into a quote about resilience and excellence in the face of failure, a snippet of audio used by generations after, and an aspect of childhood experienced by many. All three of these ads have left a lasting impact in one way or another, big or small, and are looks back at fondly. And I haven't even mentioned other popular ads from around that same time frame. Be Like Mike, arguably one of the more impactful ones out of all of these. The This Is Sports Center ads, the MV Puppet ads, Write the Future, It's Good to Have a Ring, Brazil at the Airport, and dozens more that deserve mentioning for one reason or- Oh, f my food's here.
When it comes to food ads, there are so many to look at from back in the day that can easily be classed as a classic advertisement. I'd like to buy the world a Coke, with its pleasant, catchy tune. The Noid, ensuring those who bought from Domino's would get their food in under half an hour and avoid the Noid, unlike other pizza chains. The Kool-Aid Man with his classic... Like I said, classics. That being said, there's three I want to look at in specific, and I think you'll quickly see where I'm going with this. Back in 2012, which by the way, that's almost a decade and a half ago, holy shit. Mars Inc., the guys behind Twix bars, needed to do what all great conglomerates do, make money. And so they asked the ad agency, BBDO, to come up with something, and come up with something they did. One bar drizzled and enrolled its caramel and chocolate, while the other cascaded and cloaked its caramel and chocolate. They may sound the same and look the same, but they're definitely different. And a difference in taste was something for the viewer to discover. Now, you'll be disappointed to hear that both Twixes are identical in characteristics and were merely marketed as different to sell more chocolate bars. And most sensible people quickly picked up on this, but in all honesty, it was a pretty cool idea. Back during the five years this ad campaign went on for, I heard this ad on a consistent basis, so it was always somewhat fresh in my mind at any given moment. And getting the public to choose a side and instigate and partake in discussion among their peers about which chocolate bar they got was an interesting concept on paper. Let's talk burgers, specifically McDonald's and Burger King. Back in the 1970s, Burger King wanted a bigger market share of the fast food industry, and that involved competing with McDonald's, kicking off what's been dubbed the Burger Wars. While the Burger Wars have seen other fast food burger chains get involved, such as Wendy's and Chick-fil-A, it mainly concerns McDonald's and Burger King, two of the most popular burger chains in the world. That being said, McDonald's has always been the frontrunner for the most popular fast food chain, and to showcase this popularity, McDonald's decided to do something completely unprecedented. Visit the, the French. Back in 2016, with assistance from TBWA Paris and as a giant middle finger to Burger King, McDonald's put up two billboards on a D19 between communes Brioud and Fontaine. One billboard tells drivers the nearest McDonald's drive through is 5 kilometers down the road in Brioud, while the other billboard gives directions to the nearest Burger King drive through all the way down in Nîmes, 258 kilometers away. The ad also captures reactions from drivers passing by and ends with the tagline, With more than a thousand McDrive, McDonald's is closer to you. Oh, and just so you know, Burger King only had 17 drive throughs in France, around 59 times less than McDonald's. Burger King actually ended up responding to McDonald's' ad with their own ad titled Hashtag Who is the King. Forgot to mention, but McDonald's titled their ad Hashtag McDrive King, which is why Burger King named it that which sees a couple go to say McDonald's, but only for some coffee for their long journey to Burger King in Nîmes, with the message being that a Whopper is worth a 3 plus hour long car journey, which I'm not sure I agree with, but hey, a burger's a burger, I guess. At least the comments agree with the sentiment. <laughs> what? <laughs> that being said, if you want an example of how to talk your shit while you're down, look no further than Pepsi. The most well-known food-based rivalry is between drink producers Coca-Cola and Pepsi. Known as the Cola Wars, it spans nearly half a century's worth of advertisements, good and bad, video games, a legal case about an AV-8B Harrier Mark II, you know the usual stuff, and is still ongoing to this day, with Coca-Cola having a distinct lead over Pepsi in terms of market share. And while this has been the case for a long time, it didn't stop Pepsi from talking their shit. And so was the case in 2001. Now there aren't many articles from around this time that document this whole thing and finding reputable sources that tell a consistent story was difficult, but I'll try my best to give a coherent timeline of what happened. At that time, Coke was the leader in soft drink sales, and like every winner, they decided to showboat and boast about how they had four times the amount of sales compared to their main competitor, Pepsi, in an advert Coke ran. Pepsi, not wanting to take this lying down, responded accordingly, and well, I'll let that ad speak for itself. Anyways, it was promptly banned. The reasoning for this being banned is pretty hazy, 
Some say it was due to newly imposed advertising restrictions. Others say it was because Coke felt some type of way about it. Whatever reason it was, it got the ad banned. But not before making Pepsi a ton of money. Probably, I don't know. With that being said, within all of these ads lie a pretty clear theme. That being picking a side, or in other words, brand loyalty. While I never expect people to ride or die billion dollar corporations footage unrelated, at the end of the day, people have preferences. And these ads aim to either solidify that preference, or convince those on the fence or on the other side to switch over, or at the very least, hold the other side in a more favorable light. I, I couldn't think of a better segue for this, so um... Video games. To round out this trifecta, let's look at something we all enjoy. Video games. I got the shock dodge as well! Back during times where information about games weren't leaked on a Dexerto article 4 nanoseconds after the game was revealed, video game ads, or more specifically, video game trailers, had a lot more interest and hype surrounding them, and it made the lead up to and the first viewing a lot more special, and it gave an air of mystique to them. If you want an example of what I'm talking about, let's take it back to the 24th of May, 2009. Oh wait, one sec. Much better. Activision, in a teaser trailer that didn't reveal too much, announces that it would be revealing a full-length trailer for their highly anticipated sequel to Call of Duty 4 Modern Warfare, aptly titled Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2, for the first time on the biggest stage available to them at the time, the NBA Eastern Conference Finals on May 24th. Now like I said, Activision had shown up a teaser trailer previously, that being during the Eastern Conference semi-finals of the NBA playoffs. But this would be the first time gamers and curious onlookers would be getting brand new extended footage of their upcoming game. From that time, there was a decent amount of discussion about what would be revealed in the trailer on forums across the web. Some optimistic, some skeptical, and some making very, very bold assertions in hindsight. But at the time, nobody knew any better and all they could do was wait the two weeks until the Easter Conference Finals. And that time finally came on the 24th of May 2009, where we are now. Or where. At 5.30pm Eastern Time, right before tip-off, TNT aired the first full-length trailer of Modern Warfare 2, and it showed off various locales in the upcoming campaign. In-engine footage, people getting shot at, and most importantly, a release date. People were excited. At least judging from this guy's very 2009-esque reaction. Afterwards, the trailer was put up on the MW2 website and YouTube for people to analyze and rewatch. and a condensed version of the trailer would also air during commercial breaks during the Easter Conference Finals. One word for two would release, and uh, you probably know the rest. To finish this segment off, I want to look back at something that's a lot more recent compared to everything else I've mentioned, and something most should be familiar with. 2017 saw the release of the much-anticipated Nintendo Switch, Nintendo's newest home console since the Wii U. And while the release library for that year had some hits, something was definitely missing. Nintendo Directs have always been highly anticipated events for the Nintendo community, as a chance for highly demanded games always have a chance of being revealed, even when people don't really expect it. So it was only a matter of time before a Nintendo Direct for the year of 2018 was scheduled. And we got one. March 7th saw a tweet from Nintendo announcing a Direct for the next day, and there were lots of rumors, some of which were accurate and way off looking back in hindsight. But similar to the Modern Warfare 2 trailer, no one knew anything for sure at the time, and could only wait until the next day. The Direct came through and some pretty decent stuff was showing off. An Undertale Switch port, a new Mario Tennis, Mario & Luigi Bowser's Inside Story Remake, Okami Remaster, Splatoon 2 Octo Expansion, but by the end of it, everyone was waiting for the big end of direct reveal Nintendo usually does. And Nintendo gave us what we were looking for. Now, I was there watching at the moment, and initially I thought it was just going to be some more of Splatoon DLC. That doesn't make any sense, we just got the Octo expansion revealed to us. So then I thought, oh, it's gonna be some real life stuff at somewhere like Nintendo New York. And then the lights started to dim, the action stopped, music faded, and, well, you know. So, how the hell did we go from this? Maybe it's my fault. 
Maybe I led you to believe it was easy when it wasn't. To this. <laughs>
Maybe in 10 years or so, the next generation of people will look back at some of the ads we have now in the same or similar light. Let's just hope some of the newer ads carry the same qualities of old. Anyways, that's enough out of me for now. I'm out. So there's no organs or glands or anything, right? It's just a liquid? Yeah, yeah, it's just a liquid. Um, I don't know if this is a weird question, but can I have some? <laughs>